All right, so we have in Acts 19, men were saved by the laying on of hands. Why are the why are things different here? Brother Jordan, would you like to take a stab at that one? Oh, you know I do. <laughs> I love the book of Acts. Um, I alluded to it the other night, and I will say it again. Acts is a transitional book. Um, what we're looking at in this particular scenario, these are men. Well, because our next question is actually going to be from Acts 19 as well. So let me just turn there real quick and read this section because both verses come from pretty much the same account. But we need to look at who's who is Paul talking to here and what were the circumstances involved? Because we know that this doesn't apply to us today. So let's see here. So I'm starting in chapter 19, verse one. And it came to pass while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul having passed through the upper coast came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. He said unto them, have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believe? And he said unto them, we have not been so much heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. So these people that are being referenced in this scenario, they don't even know that the Holy Ghost is here. We see that they are under a certain assumption already. And we're going to see what that assumption is. And he said unto them, unto then were ye baptized. And they said unto John's baptism. So these people were baptized back when John the Baptist, this is about 20 years earlier, when John the Baptist was baptizing people, preparing the way for the Messiah. So they have not even realized that the Messiah has come, that Pentecost has happened, that Jesus had died and rose again. So they don't even know what is happening with the um, whole gospel yet. Then Paul said, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. Again, remember, there are seven different types of baptisms in the Bible. Baptism of repentance is one. Saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, I know some people use this to say, well, do we baptize in the name of Jesus? Do we baptize in the name of Lord Jesus? Do we baptize in the Father, Son, Holy Spirit? Um, but I, 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 I don't know. I, I can't really get into that right now, but I don't think it's really, it really matters in that terms because we see Peter at Pentecost baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So, and that was after Jesus commanded him to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, and then finally finishing off in verse six, and when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them and they spake with tongues and prophesied. So what we need to realize was this was a very unique situation. And again, the Holy Spirit has been received seven, seven different ways in the book of Acts. Only one of those ways was for Gentiles. And we see that in Acts 10. We have to remember Acts teaches historically what Romans through Philemon teaches doctrinally. So we should not be pulling our doctrine from a history book. It is a weird occurrence. And I don't have all the details, but I know that these are Jewish believers who were disciples of John the Baptist, who um, did not even know that the Messiah had came. And my question to everybody who believes in baptismal regeneration is why were these men baptized twice but did not receive the Holy Spirit until Paul laid hands on them. It just doesn't make sense to me. But we know that this was a very unique situation 20 years later on Paul's third missionary journey to Ephesus. So that's kind of what I've arrived at. It's not a complete answer, but it does not apply to us today who are told to believe. We He's on his way to Ephesus. We know in Ephesians 1, 13 through 14 that what the commandment was of how we are saved and that is to believe on to the lord jesus the gospel message found in first corinthians 15 1 through 4. well that's a very good start and you made a lot of good points and i'm sure renee has more to say about that sister renee yeah how was the question worded uh, it says, in Acts 19, men were saved by the laying on of hands. Why are things different here? Well, here, here's the thing. We, we see over in Hebrews, 
like you said, it's a transition book. Um, I think that there was when the way they dealt with Jewish people is they still retained some of their rituals that they were aware of, like water baptism, the mikvah bath that represented um, uh, purification. So they still stuck to that. Uh, they knew what that meant. Uh, but in Hebrew six, those things are called dead works. Um, they're, they're not ways of, of saving us. Uh, they were rituals that pointed to Christ. So uh, it even says in the same book that the law was a shadow of the good things to come, not the very image of the things. So if you see in Hebrews 6, it says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God on the doctrine of baptisms and laying on of hands and resurrection of dead and eternal judgment. These are foundational things that uh, they shouldn't have to keep discussing, right? And this we will do if God permit. So the, the issue there was them going on. They should have been teachers by now, but they still didn't understand that some of these things were just dead works. Uh, you know, these rituals in the temple system and the Levitical law system were just dead religious works and they, they couldn't save. Now, when we see uh, the laying on of hands there, <clears throat> as you pointed out, they were Jews. They were baptized by John. Uh, they had not really understood. They just believed the kingdom was at hand and the Messiah was coming. Uh, but they hadn't heard the message of Jesus, who he is, uh, what happened. And so we know they understood that. They were being preached that. Uh, and then they didn't know what the Holy Spirit was. So we know now in Ephesians, I think it's uh, Ephesians 1, 1, 12 or 1, 13. Okay, it says, in whom ye also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So we know that the Holy Spirit, uh, we're sealed by him, and that is a down payment or an earnest of our inheritance. It's like proof of purchase of us, a down payment for the inheritance we will have in our uh, when we leave this body. So the laying on of hands there, I am not so certain uh, if that was them getting salvation uh, because I believe there was a difference during that time the signs and wonders period uh, it says the Jews require a sign right uh, so I believe uh, that was for the unbeliever these signs were for unbelievers and specifically Jewish unbelievers mostly is what we see getting the signs because they were promised the signs in the prophets in the law and the prophets so I'm not so certain. I'm I'm wondering if the laying on of hands was about the power of the Holy Spirit uh, being filled rather than being sealed. Because when you're saved, uh, you you hear the message, you trust Christ, and you have the Holy Spirit. Right? Jesus said, "You don't know where it's going, where it comes from. You you actually can't detect it. Right? You're you're it's undetectable. But that's how the birth is." It's, it's, it's a birth that you can't actually see, right? So uh, I believe it's possible that these were Jewish converts. The hands were being laid on them so that they would be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit so that they could go back to the Jews and heal and do other miracles so that they could preach the gospel and convert some other Jews. Like I think... The, the laying on the hands was a transfer of the power of the Holy Spirit so that those people could go back and, and save souls as well. So that's what I thought the laying on of hands there was. Also, the laying on of hands refers to imputing sin upon a sacrificial animal. Uh, so in Hebrews 6, I believe that's what it's referring to. When it says of baptisms and laying on of hands, there's several things that are Jewish rituals with laying on the hands. One is the transfer of the sin of the nation 
or of the sin of the person, the priest would lay his hands on the animal and impute the sin or transfer the sin of the nation or person onto that animal. And then the animal was killed as a sacrifice to pay for that sin. But we know it didn't, you know, save anybody. It was a shadow of Christ dying for our sins. So uh, in one case, I believe the laying on of hands was uh, the imputation of sin as we get God's imputed righteousness. Uh, and in that particular case, I think it might be possible that Paul was actually uh, passing on a gift, the power of the Holy Spirit, so that they could go on to do the miraculous things. Paul talks about those that minister miracles among them. So I, I'm thinking more along the lines that this is about transferring a gift so that they can get others saved through the signs and miracles. Okay, thank you. A lot of good points were made. Um, well, uh, now I, I've heard you say this, uh, I think twice now, Jordan, and I'm glad you're saying it um, because this is something that um, very few people realize. Uh, you said that the book of Acts is a transitional book. As a matter of fact, if you were to read almost any Bible commentary, uh, there's, there's hundreds of commentaries, uh, the theologians teaching and explaining what the scriptures mean. But if you read all the different commentaries on Acts, it'll be hard to find a commentary that doesn't say the same thing, that, they, that we have to see the book of Acts as a transitional book. Now, a transition, what does that mean? It means that you're, you're in the process of changing from one thing into another thing. You're going through a transitional period. Uh, this is so important. Um, this, this has totally changed my, my view on some things, and my, particularly my understanding of the book of James, uh, the way I see it now, and, and uh, everything else that's going on, in, uh, as you see in the book of Galatians and, and Romans and so on. It seems like you, we know that Paul uh, is being pursued by these Judaizers, and they, the scripture says that he had a thorn in his flesh. And uh, I, I believe that's uh, just an old fashioned way of saying a pain in my ass. These guys are a pain in my ass. They are, they are uh, uh, constantly following me. Every, every church I establish, they're trying to run my church and say I'm a false apostle. So you see this conflict going on, and what's the argument about? Well, here's a, let's say that this is the, this is the transitional period. And over here we have, okay, before Jesus, you had basically two viewpoints. You had the pharisaical viewpoint, which was uh, your, you establish your own righteousness. And then you had the viewpoint that we see from the, the tax collector. When you have the Pharisee and the tax collector at the temple, the Pharisee says, oh, I'm not like these other people. I do this and I do that and I do it. See, he's talking about his own righteousness, boasting to God about his righteousness. And then, the, but the other viewpoint from by the um, tax collector, he just fell prostrate on, on the ground and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. So the correct viewpoint before uh, uh, Jesus and the cross was uh, you, uh, you relying completely on God to be your savior. That's the message of the Old Testament. God will provide a savior uh, instead of thinking that you can make you can make yourself acceptable to God. So that was those were the two viewpoints. And then Christ came. He had his ministry, his death, burial, and resurrection. He had, he had Pentecost and the ascension. Uh, well, what happened at the very beginning of the church? Well, first problem was. Uh, they uh, much of the church did not uh, understand that uh, one that um, the the gospel is that uh, we're, we're Jesus did it all for us. We don't we don't uh, believe in our own righteousness at all. It has to be believing in Jesus entirely uh, as as the solution. And the other thing that they didn't understand in the, initially in the church was that. Uh, Jesus came to save the world, not just Israel and the, and the Jewish people. So uh, with these two problems at the beginning of the church, uh, you see this period going from that place to the end of the book of Acts, uh, where finally uh, the other end of the spectrum is, okay, you have to reject Judaism. You cannot mix Judaism and Christ. You have to pick. You're going to be religious and be under the law and be under a curse, 
or you're going to reject that and believe entirely on Christ. So Paul says, you can't mix them or you've ruined it. Uh, so uh, this is a transition going from this point of view to this point of view. And that's what the book of Acts accounts this uh, as these things were becoming evident and, and accepted. Uh, now, the Holy Spirit, how does it fit in all this? Um, the, in the Old Testament, people did not receive the Holy Spirit and, and uh, the ba baptism and sealed as we are. Um, certain prophets in the Old Testament would be um, um, filled with the Holy Spirit in order to, God would empower them to do miracles. Uh, but it was a temporary thing where the Spirit would come into them to give them this power. Uh, and, and the people who believed, as the, um, as the tax collector believed, he was, I imagine he was saved because he had faith that God would provide the Savior, even though he didn't know who he was yet, but he didn't have the Holy Spirit. And the same thing with these people that we read in this account here. Um, they're believing in um, um, uh, John's baptism, and, uh, and that's repentance, and uh, it, it's not the gospel. And so they, they, they believe in that sense but they don't have the Holy Spirit because they lack two things. It says, I don't know about the Holy, who, what the Holy Spirit is. They've never heard of the Holy Spirit. And they believed in John, not in Jesus, John the Baptist. So uh, once they, they explained the gospel that, no, you need to believe in Jesus. And what he, he's the, he came, he's the one that was pro, uh, prophesied. And they believed in him. Now they're believing in Jesus instead of uh, uh uh, the old way, so now they get the Holy Spirit. So I, I, I think, and the, the reason that these things were happening visibly, like speaking in tongues, and, and uh, that was necessary because at that time, they needed dramatic things to happen that people could see. And, and by seeing it, they say, this is spectacular. And they recognize that something powerful and spiritual uh, is, is going on here. So those things happened at that time because at that time, uh, miracles and signs and wonders were necessary to jumpstart the, ch the church. Uh, it got off to a quick start because of all these miraculous signs and, and, and wonders. Uh, okay, as far as the laying on of, of hands, um, it, it's just part of the visible things that they did to, to, sh to let the audience see that, okay, I'm laying on hands and... Uh, where uh, they believe in Jesus and now the Holy Spirit's come, come to them. And uh, so this was all done as part of a presentation for the audience, not, not, not necessarily for the believer, uh, but for the, the people who are observing. Uh, uh, brother, yes. Uh, a person in the chat put it simply, and I like how you put it. Do you remember when I was saying, when they laid on hands, I felt it was more about the feeling like, like transferring a gift of healing to someone so that they could heal, uh, save from temporal things. He put it that way. He said, uh, the laying on of hands was for saving people in, with earthly problems, like mortal issues. Like if someone was sick or uh, on the verge of death, you laid on hands to heal them. Uh, and he mentions the book of James. There is, if a person is sick, you get the elders to lay hands and anoint him and pray. So, uh, I do believe that's a good way to put it, that the laying on of hands was about temporal salvation, not eternal salvation. Uh, eternal salvation, you know, by faith in Jesus. I, I, would say that. I, I think that's probably probably gener generally correct. But I think in the context of Acts 19, the, there's no indication that there's sickness or anything like that being addressed. Right, right. So I think that the actual laying on of hands there was the power of the Holy Spirit. So that they could, could also uh, uh, get people saved. They'd have the power to preach and go back. They were Jewish converts. Uh, so I, I think that was more about empowering them rather than uh, the Holy Spirit didn't come and seal them. Just because they didn't understand what the Holy Spirit was doesn't mean if they heard the message, they didn't get the Holy Spirit. It had been poured out on Pentecost. So... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with how y'all interpreted that. It's just, I still feel like that was more of an empowerment to that person uh, than anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that they just did the wrong gospel. Uh, they, they believed, but they were not believing that, uh, okay, the, 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 the Savior actually came. That's they, right. 
That's right. So, so until they got the gospel right, they couldn't they didn't get the Holy Spirit. So maybe they had the Holy Spirit and then the hands were to give some uh, empower them. Uh, or maybe it was a visible sign to, for the audience. I don't, I'm not really so sure about that, but uh, they certainly had to change their belief because they hadn't believed the real cost to get. And one thing that we um, don't see in the Bible, but we know from church history, is there was a lot of heresy going around um, during the ministry of John the Baptist where people actually thought John the Baptist, his own disciples were going out saying that he was the Messiah. So there was a lot of miscommunication about who the Messiah actually was. And we do get a glimpse of that um, when we see Jesus baptizing on the other side of the Jordan and his disciples come to John the Baptist, like, w w what's he doing? Um, but I think that's important to realize. I don't think that pertains to these individuals because they seemed very quick to take to the message. But it is important to realize that some of those teachings were going around around that time.